Hi everyone, so today I'm going to get a bit more technical and I wanted to talk more specifically about financial translations and I wanted to do this for several reasons. First of all, well first of all is how I kind of started and how I came up. It was, uh, I, was special, I worked in finance originally and then I got into translation so I specialize in financial translations. Also, it's one of the specializations now that I offer as, uh, you know, with my agency basically. We offer financial translations and so it's a lot of what I've been doing. I also notice it's a lot of what you've been doing. A lot of people that I talk to specialize in financial translations or business or accounting or something like that, but you know, they'll, uh, they offer financial translations or they say they offer financial translations. So anyway, I wanted to talk a bit more about it because it isn't as simple as being like, well, I'll just you know, offer translations in finance as well. I, you know, I know how to say banks and, uh, and you know, some other financial terms in my other language and so it's fine. Because uh, it can go deeper than that. First of all, financial translations usually, you know, th this will include, well, it'll include a lot of financial statements, income statements, statement of cash flows, balance sheet, you know, whatever, you, all, all that good stuff. And this requires a tremendous amount of attention to detail. And so whenever I am looking at prospective translators to deal in finance, no matter what language it is, I always want to pay attention to their attention to detail. Uh, this doesn't necessarily mean that every time they email me back and forth it has to be fluent and perfect English or whatnot, you know, especially if they're translating into their own language, Chinese, Spanish, whatever it might be, then, you know, fine, I'll assume they're native in that tongue. But I do want them to pay attention to detail. You know, if they're, they're not going to write it accidentally to the wrong person or send the email to the wrong person or send the wrong stuff or this and that because I really do want someone who's uh, good at detail. And that's because I know there's so much to deal with, so much minute detail with all the numbers and everything categorized here and there. There's nothing worse for a translator, by the way, when they assign a translation, say a financial statement, and they say, okay, we need all this stuff translated into, uh, into whatever language, you know, and so we have accounts receivable, accounts payable, you know, this, that, and the other. There's nothing worse than if you send back a translation of everything listed out on a Word document, and then they have to spend, you know, an hour trying to copy and paste what you did and put in the right box, make sure it's the right box and do all that and make sure the format is fine, everything. If you want to be worth enough, like if you want to be worth more, if you want to be able to charge more, and if you want to be able to be, you know, professional when you do your translations, you're going to put it into the same, uh, in, into the same table or whatever, chart or something that they have. You want to minimize the amount of work they need to do once they receive your translation. So you need to do as much as you can for them. And it's easier for you as well because you know what terms go in which box. You know, they don't. And so they're, they're kind of guessing there. So I really uh, think it's something that you should try to go the extra mile in and, uh, and not just be like, well, I translated what accounts payable is in my language, so that's all they hired me to do. Yeah, a lot of people do that, and that's true. But that's why you shouldn't do that. That's why you should do something extra and kind of show that you do go the extra mile. And, you know, and financial translations, unfortunately, it has a lot of that. And you'll find, you know, while most other translations, it's usually just a Word document or it's text or whatever it might be. And so it's very easy. You just send, I mean, it's not easy, but, you know, it's, it's simple in that sense because you just send the text back and that's it. With financial stuff, you really do have all these things. And so you kind of need to pay attention. Obviously, obviously, if it's in Word, it's easier. But many times what I've had to do as a translator is take what's written out or sorry, if it's written in Excel, it's easier. But what I have to do is take what's written in Excel and then I'm getting all these confused. OK, many times I found myself what I have to do is take what's written in Word and then put it into Excel so I can have it in table format again and then put it back into Word or, you know, some variation thereof just so that it's I can send the client something clean that I know they can use right away. And, uh, and, you know, I don't have to worry too much about all the formatting because Word gets totally weird when you try to do weird things in, uh, in formatting. So I, um, anyway, it's just something to keep in mind. Another thing to keep in mind is also many times you'll be, say you re receive an RFP, you, you know, request for a proposal, or you receive, you know, any type of documentation, people are trying to enter into a new country. Say they're trying to go to China or to uh, Bolivia, whatever it might be. 
And uh, you happen to know, because you do translations into that language, that they have different accounting standards. You know, then that's something legitimate. You can bring up with them. You can be like, look, I'm happy to translate this. But by the way, uh, I notice you bring up these and this accounting standards. Uh, they have different accounting standards in this country. Um, do you want me to make my translation conform to that or not? If you're able to do that, once again, it's something that makes you very valuable as a translator. And it means you can charge that much more. If you're able to catch that and do that. And if you look, uh, I, I can put a link for this somewhere below, but if you look up accounting standards in, uh, I think there's a Wikipedia page. Yeah, accounting, uh, then you see the list of different accounting standards around the world. And you see, you know, Canada, France, Germany, India, Luxembourg, Nepal, Russia, you know, all these, there are a whole bunch of countries that have different accounting standards. And um, you don't want to, uh, I mean, you want to point it out to your client, be like, look, if you're entering this country, maybe you should try to conform to their accounting standards. And anyway, you, you find these all over, you, you know, you'll see GAP, you'll see like FASB, you'll see stuff like that. And this is all stuff that uh, can help you out. By the way, it's not stuff that, you know, only can help you go the extra mile, it's stuff you have to keep track of. For instance, numbers. Numbers are different everywhere you go. If you want to write just 1,000, one, I'm here in the States right now. If I want to write 1,000 here, it's 1, 000. And um, in fact, I'm going to get the whiteboard for this just to show you. Okay, so if I'm in the States, this is how I write 1,000, right? However, if I am in Italy, I switch those two around. Here, I'll do it under it just so you can see the difference. That's how I would write it in Italy. See? This goes here and the comma, you say virgola zero zero means dot zero. This is, uh, anyway, it gets switched around basically. Now, if I'm in Switzerland, it's still different because I would write it this way. I'm getting confused. No, yeah. Anyway, you put this for 1,000 in Switzerland. And every country has their own thing, right? Has their own way of writing this. And you need to keep track of this when you're doing your translations. Uh, by the way, then if you go into East Asia, they don't even divide it. Well, I mean, it, it can get so confusing. You go to places in East Asia uh, because it, technically they don't divide it by three like this. But what they do in East Asia is they divide it by four. like that. So it, so while, you know, in English and most of the West, you'll say something like, you know, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, a million, 10 million, 100 million, et cetera, et cetera. Here it goes by four. And this is Korea, this is Japan, this is China. And then when you get to China, then they have their Chinese characters for different numbers and they have other old fashioned Chinese characters they use in banks to make sure, you know, because they're, they look more distinctive and to make sure they don't get confused. So it can get as confusing as you want it to get. So you need to make sure you know this and you can offer this to the client. And, um, and unfortunately, it's not always obvious and it's not always done. Uh, a lot of translators don't do this and, uh, and it can be dangerous because with finance, you're dealing with a, you know, a lot of finance and a lot of big numbers. And uh, so a lot can be at stake. And you want to be someone reliable because if people can't count on you to get this stuff right, then it can be very dangerous. And so even if you get the translations right, but then you're copying down the numbers and you get the numbers wrong, that can be dangerous. If you get the numbers, if you know, you're messing up the commas and stuff like that with the numbers, that can be dangerous. Um, and so people really, so you should really try to pay attention to uh, pay attention to detail. For finance, you have to pay attention to detail. You have to pay attention to the numbers and you have to know what you're doing. Um, I usually, uh, I recommend that, uh, you know, you have some financial background. If you studied finance or you worked in finance for a bit or something along those lines, you can't just jump into finance. And you, if you, if you've been translating literature or, you know, even website marketing material, stuff like that, you can't just jump into finance. You need to, uh, know something about finance just because it can get so specific. I'm sure there are other areas. Look, there are other areas that are a lot more specialized. You get into engineering or medical and stuff like that. I won't touch those, but I do deal with finance. So I can tell you that there are quite a few issues with this. And these are just some of the main ones. 
So, uh, so hopefully that helps out if you are working in finance or if you're thinking about working in finance to see if uh, it's the right uh, move for you. Uh, feel free to let me know if, uh, if there are any other issues in finance that maybe I, I didn't mention or, uh, or, or yeah, if you have other things in your specialty, um, you know, that you need to be careful about. I mean, every specialty has its own things that uh, you need to look for, has its own way of translating its own mentality. I've already mentioned before, fiction can be so different from anything along the lines of nonfiction, basically, because, you know, it's a completely different mentality when you're translating. So it can be really interesting. Anyway, hopefully this helps out. If you find this useful, please don't forget to click thumbs up because that always helps because I know which videos work in the future. Um, and uh, otherwise, don't forget to subscribe and you'll get more videos. Thanks. Bye.